So I have to say continue. Mm -hmm. I assent. I give my consent and my assent and my enthusiastic yes. Well, why, why don't you introduce yourself? <laughs> Hello, I'm Winston Brown. I play Teresa Sackler on sure do. Dope Sick. Sure do. That's sure what we're here I. to talk about. I also, uh, given the subject, uh, uh, rather the the person of my incredible interlocutor here and the narrator of Sarah by JT Leroy aka Laura Albert and that's what brought us together um, and I'm so happy to be here with you today thanks Laura thank you for making time uh, <laughs> I I am really excited that there are so many people who are artists in on a, in every echelon of life uh and i run into them and they're like oh i know winsome you know and it, it, it's it's for every and i i was um on instagram with uh the australian musician ben lee and i was like uh oh can i send you um to, to listen to audiobooks and it's like out of the the audiobook reader is great winsome brown he's like ah <laughs> i love winsome and it's like, uh, <laughs> i love ben. ben is married to ioni sky and uh she's she's an old friend and such a dear person and i'm so happy for the two of them they have a daughter and they've had this incredible year in australia they have a daughter together and then uh ioni also has another beautiful daughter who happens to be my husband Claude's goddaughter oh my gosh oh wow and and that's funny because Ioni is Donovan's sister, sister. right that's right and and he reads one of the stories on the heart is deceitful it's a very small world it's a very small world indeed so yeah I, and it's funny I wasn't like sometimes I'll be talking to someone and I forget how we're connected or what that was or that they know someone or they were actually somewhere where something happened i'm telling them about it and they're like uh yeah i was there i'm like oh yeah yeah um i just saw ben do an amazing performance on TikTok with kimia dawson who's such a wonderful songwriter and performer and the two of them are just incredible together can you send that to me yeah well i can send you the link i guess uh I'm not on TikTok. It. Oh, me neither this was he posted it yeah which often it's hard actually if you're not on tiktok to find it anyway my kid is on tiktok so mm. i'll get her to somehow send it okay yeah i mean they're available on instagram but i give myself time out times mm. time out on instagram because even if i go for one thing i just notice how i start to feel i even if i'm going with a mission to check out one thing i notice that if if I'm looking at political things that are very directed activists, that's great. But once I start going into, I watch one person sing, but then all of a sudden next I'm into influencers and somebody showing some kind of, it, it's engineered to show off and, or something. And it, it's me, it's me and my feelings. And I, I, I get sucked into it. It's dangerous. So. Well, and it's, gosh, maybe this brings us to our subject mm -hmm. of our discussion because it's engineered to make you want the next hit. I mean, the, in the internet is, is clearly being pitched to respond to our pleasure centers or perhaps our fear centers. I don't know what makes oh, us- think, Yeah, both. But both yeah. of those things. And, um, and so, so is a drug like, I mean, Oxycontin is pitched to, was, was designed and sold to make people want more and to just sell more of it. And um, Let, let's talk about what it, what we're talking about. Um, Winsome plays Teresa Sackler, one of the Sackler families which own Purdue, 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 Purdue Pharma. Yeah, I love that uh, confusion about what's the problem with the chicken man. We're going to go after the chicken manufacturers. It's like, actually, you should, too. Um, <laughs> yes, they deserve uh, a bit of attention but um about oxycontin and the opioid epidemic and it's uh, the hulu mini series uh limited series right yeah called dope sick and created by danny strong 
based on uh what's the book it's based on it's based uh partly on beth macy's book dope sick and and the cast is just phenomenal it's, it's an incredible ensemble cast i mean it's it's a true feat of of writing and direction and performance because there are at least four storylines that are each equally important and vital and each of them has multiple characters and they're interwoven kind of seamlessly so that the audience is following a complex story but in a way that is um, understandable and uh, really fulfilling. And, and very relatable. Um, yeah. It, and you can see how as the opioids were introduced, I had no idea about the label that the FDA uh, had labeled that had labeled, had given the stamp of approval that Oxycontin uh, was less addictive, less than 1% of people when it was very much not true. Yeah, the label says something like, I'm, this is a total paraphrase, but because of its time release uh, action, it is believed to be less addictive. And though it, and a label like that had never been put on a class two narcotic. And so that was absolutely instrumental in convincing doctors to prescribe this narcotic casually um, for, for intermediate pain or for, for a kind of medium pain and for long-term pain to, uh, to their patients. And that had never been done before. Those kinds of narcotics were usually used in end of life care for very serious care, um, you know, in hospital. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and it's very hard when you have a doctor telling you um, and people are coming with a kind of uh, intersection of problems, which are often intermingled with psychological, uh, a physical illness um, doesn't make it any easier and can be informed by the psychological. And it makes you all the more ripe for um, addiction. And it seems like uh, it, they knew this. I mean, they targeted areas where there was uh, people had very hard physical labor intensive jobs and were more likely to get hurt and um, and the loss of, of being able to work that how that uh, affects somebody's pride and pride and and income I mean people are working day to day hand to mouth so losing days or weeks of work is is not an option for many people and so getting through their pain in order to be able to take home their paycheck was right. essential and so drugs were I mean, drugs, painkillers like OxyContin um, were a crutch. And there was a database. One of the things that the show, uh, that Dope Sick shows is that Arthur Sackler, who was the eldest of the three Sackler brothers who founded and owned Purdue Pharma, um, he uh, invented a database that showed what drugs were being used where. And this medical database allowed Purdue salespeople and, and sales, um, the sales department to figure out who is already prescribing painkillers because we could go in there and switch them to Oxy. And then once they're hooked on Oxy, we could up the dose. And that's, that's really what happened. It was targeted. It was, um, it was really lethal what they did. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty insi insidious. And even, I guess, was, was Arthur uh, marketed, did they create Valium? Mother's yes, I, I believe so that the, the I, I don't think it was named Purdue Pharma at that point, but the Sacklers created and marketed Valium and um, all of the techniques that were used uh, to sell Oxy to the world were originally used to sell Valium. So getting doctors to, to be spokespeople for the drug. Um, in fact, Arthur had used that because they came from advertising. Medical advertising was how, how the brothers initially made money. Um, and they used to sell cigarettes and they would say, I believe they made the ad for camel. More doctors prefer, more doctors yeah. Yeah. encourage their patients to use camels, right? Oh, camels. And, and, and they began that process of using, putting doctor's cards, sometimes fake doctor's cards in their advertisements, having people stand in as doctors or paying doctors. So they might be real doctors, but they were yeah. being funded, um, 
and and paid to give their endorsement and so that was used on valium and valium was targeted to women largely there was a lot of stuff um pathologizing uh pain in women calling women neurotic and in that time when when the country was moving into suburbs and there was a lot of isolation as people had left the kind of communities that just spring up naturally when you're in a city mm. um, and so so families were becoming nuclear and individual in in the suburbs there was a ton of loneliness and they just went in there and pitched Valium to all those people and said you have a problem you're you're neurotic and you hysterical, need hysterical you're hysterical you're yeah. hysterical it's, which comes it's... from womb hysterical is itself a, a word that pathologizes womanhood because it comes from the womb which is the hyster like a hysterectomy is when you take out your womb. Yeah, I, I I'm very familiar with that kind of diagnosis. Uh, it's if a woman expresses emotion, uh, and you also have at that time period women who were in the workforce during World War II, and when the men came home, uh, they wanted to move the women out of the jobs. And it was the idea of you're a homemaker. This is what you need to do. And women were very fulfilled working. Right. And My grandmother worked building liberty ships. Yeah, yeah. Now, and now when, she, know. when she was kicked out of that job, she became an alcoholic. I mean, it was very difficult for somebody who was intelligent and keen and smart. And she was a brilliant manager. This is this in Vancouver, Washington. She worked, you know, uh, building liberty ships. And... Um, so many women were sent back home and and the television programs stuff like leave it to beaver came up at that time pitching this totally fake notion of this kind of june cleaver woman who just loved to bake cookies for her kids and 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 make this home and be a kind of a uh, paper doll of a woman yeah and, and there was no conversation about how uh the laws that were being passed, forget about even uh, for people of color, but that women were not allowed, the quotas on professions, how they weren't even allowed. You know, I, it's like when you watch uh, the documentary on Ruth Bader Ginsburg, how there was a library that she wasn't even allowed access to, even though she was a student there because she wasn't a woman. I mean, because she was a woman. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, I, yeah, I, so... I, I guess, um, so, well, how did you get involved in, in Dope Sick? Uh, through the regular channels. I submitted an audition. I was, you know, invited to audition. I auditioned and, uh, and, and got the part. And, and it was an interesting, um, interesting journey, actually. I had read about the Sacklers years before um, when an article in the New Yorker came out describing what they had done and how they had actively known um, as a company what their product was doing and how they kept going. They, right. they not only kept going selling in America, they were like, oh, great, let's sell to Europe. Let's try right. to sell to Asia. Right. Um, so let's get as much of the world hooked on this as possible. And I had been really really appalled when I read that article. So when I was invited to audition, I was, I was really excited at the thought of being involved in something that tells this story that has um, affected so many Americans. 500,000 Americans have died from overdose. And, uh, and this is largely because of companies like Purdue Pharma and their marketing of these, these drugs. They're very irresponsible and um, deadly marketing and uh, of these drugs so anyway um i got the job and and then it was exciting to try and research what's teresa sackler like and what are the sacklers like because she's a dame uh, right she's a dame she was she was given her damehood in 2011 what does that mean work. exactly a dame it's like a knighthood she, like okay. she's she's day it's the it's the female equivalent of being sir so and so no it's she's because dame. she donated so much she's a huge philanthropist the yeah. the mortimer and Teresa sackler foundation gives I mean, in recent years, things have changed a little bit and, and museums have stopped uh, accepting their donations, but they would give like seven and a half uh, million pounds, which is many more dollars. I mean, maybe that's like 14 million or something or 10 million. I don't know, my exchange rate isn't top notch right now, but 
but they would give they would give a lot a lot of money um, to to institutions. She's a trustee of the Victoria and Albert Museum. A very very I went important. There. <laughs> Excellent. I am Laura Victoria Albert, after all. Oh, of course. Is that just by coincidence? Nothing ever is. No, it never is. It's a very, it's wow. a way, you know. Uh, that's so great. Um, but trying to to learn what she was like was one of the first challenges as an actress because I don't know if you know this, but the Sacklers have wiped the internet clean. Um, wow. I mean, somebody like Teresa Sackler must have attended hundreds of ribbon cuttings, must have presented awards, must have been given awards, must have been at social events, on video, because any of us who lives a life is on the internet. Right. Um, and somebody who's as prominent as she is, all the more so. There's nothing, there's not a single clip of video of, of any of them. Well, there's some pictures of, of her. There's a couple of pictures, like three or four. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and those were important to me. And, and then I, I researched by calling up English artists to say, you know, have you ever, have you ever heard her speak? What's her voice like? Because, you know, um, English accents are all kinds of different things. What did and they say? Is it a posh kind of? Accent? Yes, that it was sort of RP, which, which means received pronunciation, but also that's a little gentler than a very, very strong English accent because she's, she's married to an American. She spends a lot of time internationally. So with people who, who speak uh, different languages or have different accents, so that all influences her. But I was given a really great description of her voice by, by one friend who said, it's like a, uh, an off-white four-ply cashmere jumper. Wow, that's very good. <laughs> Isn't that so great? Off white, like yeah. so, so classy. Off white. Off white, yes. Yeah, not coffee. No, no, no. <laughs> not the weak tea. No. <laughs> um, it, you know, one thing I was struck by in your performance is in the performances that I've experienced of yours, you exude warmth even when. Like your character in News of the World is a stern um, Norwegian. She's German, Texas German. Sure. Okay, um, I won't say same thing, but uh, or even worse. But but yeah, there's I I feel the warmth and the complexity, um, the uh, the kind of um, humanity uh, see seeping through. And with this, which is natural with a, a, a child, but doesn't necessarily, someone else could have just played it straight, kind of like, you know, giving nothing. Mm -hmm. I really felt that your Teresa Sackler could encounter a dead body or a body just laying on the ground and just walk over and, or ask someone to remove the body, you know? Uh that's 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 funny. Uh, the truth is, I think she's somebody who's very beloved by her friends. Um, you know, uh, uh, she's she uh, was going to be a nun, so I think there's probably uh, a, a heart to her, and that was something that I explored as I began to think about the the character. But you know, as as actors, we're the character in the scene, so were there that scene with the dead body, we might see a different side of her, but we saw her in, in board meetings and, um, you know, in glamorous events where she's sort of like, uh, the beautiful and loving wife. I think she and Mortimer, I mean, this is the thing that's strange. I think they have a, they had, he's, he's dead now, but uh, a very loving marriage. They had three children together. They, um, I think, were kind of a, a warm and gracious couple, uh, very beloved by lots and lots of people um, and unnecessary because of how much money they gave. Uh, and yet that's not the full story because I, I was sort of looking for the heart in her as a performer and thinking that perhaps she might be a protester in the whole OxyContin thing. Maybe, maybe within Purdue, she might be a voice of dissent. But then as I 
continued to do research, I realized, you know, Purdue had, uh, when, they, when they realized that their OxyContin gig game might jig, I guess the jig might be up, um, uh, they founded a generic company called Rhodes in order to continue making um, narcotic opioids wow. and uh, under a different name. So to keep the money stream coming in, just not under OxyContin. And Teresa Sackler is on the board of that company as well. She was on the, she's on the board. She resigned from the board of Purdue in 2017, but she was on the board. You this know, she Shell had game. a seat at the table. Yeah. She had a seat at that table yeah. and you know, I can't know what she was saying in every meeting, but I know that she went on to have an important seat in this subsidiary company and, and they were continuing the work. So um, she's, I, I, I can't give her a pass just because she sort of seems to be beloved by her friends. Well, her friends there are. were plenty of people who were slave traders and were beloved, you know. Exactly, that's exactly right. You know, that were charming and that were, uh, and there were certain rules among, I mean, there's plenty of people who, and, and I noticed that there, there can be compartmentalization uh, that, and you find that especially among certain classes and there are just things you don't do and things you, um, I mean, by, going out into the world with JT Leroy, I got to crash a lot of those um, galas and those um, be invited to people's houses and be that fly, invisible fly in the wall and see people who were, and be living with for a little while with people who were beloved and considered to do wonderful things, also be incredibly shitty and, um, behave horribly and espouse some really awful uh, uh, beliefs, uh, uh, kind of a myth making about themselves. And um, yeah, so so it doesn't surprise me that she was, you know, beloved and or it doesn't, I mean, we would like our villains to be villains all the way, you know, or uh but um but how much how much kind of more villainous or even more human is it oh oh who was it i think it's i think it's robert louis stevenson had a line that said the devil himself let it be known can sometimes do a very gentlemanly thing that's 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 the complexity that is what I was looking for in people to understand Sarah, the mother I created, you know, that people are born out of situations and it and context is everything. And that um, it's really complex when you have um, the more the more good there is within somebody. That's why I think people get up and defend all these people. Uh, they're the last to accept that someone might be a predator. Mm -hmm. um, I was curious what kind of backstory, like I was speaking to director Darnell Martin, you know, from also she did a story on the heart is deceitful. And we, I just did a really great interview with her. And she talked about how she gives, well, she asks everyone to find a backstory, even to the background characters, you know? which often are just, they're just standing, they're just standing there, but they're important at, to make uh, the whole, to give to the whole energy of a scene. What did you create a backstory for? Well, I, I researched Teresa Sackler yeah. much, as, as much as I could. I read everything that I could find. I learned about her. I learned, as I mentioned before, that she had, she had uh, been going to be a nun she, was, she had been a, a Catholic uh, girl from Staffordshire and, and that she's quite a loving mother to her children. And so, and, and, and then I could bring some of myself into that. I'm a mother, I know what that is. And um, so I, I, I did as much research as I could and then put what I knew of, of her world and, and family business 
um, mm. which I have some exposure to through my husband's family, actually, uh, who had a family business that also had um, legal conflicts. So this, those board meeting scenes where you have like two sides of the family and everybody has their lawyers, Claude had that um, as part of his youth. So mm. th there were some things that I was able to, and I could just see how he is, how, how does somebody who has experienced that behave? Um, so I studied from life. Um, I, I did the research and then I brought as much as I could to it. And one thing that was quite beautiful is on our very first kind of all Sacklers uh, day of shooting, which was uh, a boardroom scene with the family in two parts, um, uh, the, the Raymond Sackler wing at one side of the table, the A shares and the B shares, which was the Mortimer Sackler side of the table at the other. Um, Walter Bobby, who plays Mortimer Sackler, my husband, and is a big theater director. He's, a, he's an actor who's done great work in film and television and mm. theater, but also is a, is a Broadway theater director. He directed Chicago. Wow. He said in, in, uh, in, in one of the pauses between takes, he was like, wow, this is like a, a theater company. This is like the first time we're in the room and it's like, we've been together for months. This is amazing. And there was this real sense of, um, kinship. Uh, I have to say the Sacklers are obviously beasts in the real world, but all the actors playing the yeah, Sacklers yeah, are yeah, yeah. awesome. And, and we had, uh, we had a kind of warm and family relationship. And I had to make a choice about, you know, how was I within the family? And my choice was uh, mostly that I think I, I would prefer peace, that, that the discord and the fighting within the family made me uncomfortable. Um, and that I preferred uh, something more loving, but at the same time, uh, have some cold steel, cold fire. I mean, Teresa Sackler is no um, weep wilting flower. She's, she's, she's a woman who has, has power and determination and, and gets what she wants. Where was that filmed? Was it in an actual museum? And you filmed during COVID as well, right? We did. We filmed from January to May in... 2021 this year and it was filmed in Richmond Virginia so those Sackler board scenes were at the Richmond um, Museum of Art which is a beautiful wow. place really beautiful place it had some amazing Kahindi Wiley pieces as well as um, classical and you know romantic art it was it was really wonderful so it wasn't an actual former Sackler wing or anything no no that that is at the Met uh, but they changed the name I, I know in some places they've taken the Sackler name off. Not, not so much in the UK, a lot in... In, uh, in the US, and Nan Golden led an amazing protest, an amazing protest at the Guggenheim. Um, I saw that with the pills, yeah. With the pills in the, and the bottles and in the Temple of Dendur. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I don't know. I, I just can't speak to which ones have been taken off and which ones haven't. Some have, some, some are still called Sackler. So what did you have to do during filming? COVID wise? Yeah. Um, you test before you get, before you come onto set. So there's a pre-test. And then once you're working, you're testing every two days. So where did um, you stay? Were you in a hotel or? Yes, in the, uh, it was called the Marriott. And I chose the one that the, there was a Marriott residence in yeah. where you had a little kitchen. And I would drive down actually. I drove down twice and I flew down twice. I went down there four times for the six episodes that I was in. And uh, I drove down and I brought a cooler full of food. Mm -hmm. And uh, because at the, at the residence, there was a little kitchen and some pots and pans. And I really wasn't going inside to restaurants. Um, I still right. am not quite honestly. I mean, I'll go, I'll go and sit and eat outside, but especially during working, I mean, just the thought of testing positive. And this uh, was before, this was before the vaccine, right? We got vaccinated. Most of the cast and crew got vaccinated during. I got my vaccines in, in April. And so by the last episodes, I was vaccinated. And um, that relaxed things a little bit, but still the, pro the protocols really didn't change. On set, we wore masks um, right until, the ca until action. Um, so we'd take off our masks right before. And in fact, I noticed like 
on some of the scenes, you'd see the lines of the mask oh, on wow. people's face. And I was like, there are going to be drinking games about all the programs shot during this pandemic time because ah. it'll be like, can you spot the can you spot the indentation on the cheeks? Can you spot the mask in the actor's pocket? Because it'll be like, okay, masks off, ready and action. It used and, to be like the Starbucks coffee cup in the uh... exactly. It'll be totally like that because you have to stick the mask somewhere, <laughs> and so there'll be like I'm sure there's going to be like little bits of masks sticking out of people's pockets. You'll be like filming. There'll be some period piece that's set in the 1800s and you'll see like a mask. Right, right. And right. the other thing is we had shields. Oh. We had shields on set. So it was it was very serious. The, and the okay, shields went under the table. In some, in pretty much all of the scenes you're in, you guys are eating. So my quite that must have been another complication. I imagine with the makeup logistics, that adds a whole other. I mean, because I remember just from filming the documentary. I uh, sometimes they would come over it was like with a straw to you know so you don't mess anything up um did first of all did you did you eat were you actually eating yes a little um <laughs> it was funny actually in one of those scenes uh they were like the director was like we're moving a lot just like you know you can you can eat or maybe you wouldn't be eating so we kind of did it both ways and then um the way the plates were set up, it was like a plate on top of another plate and then a fork and knife. So if you laid, if you ate and then put your fork down, the fork would slide off. Oh no. And, and so then makes like a big clatter. And oh, in no. those scenes, you'll see the camera is just circling the room. In the scene, in the ones that Barry Levinson directed, which is that first one. Right, 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 yeah. Around. Um, and so if you make a big clatter in the middle of a take like that, you can you know screw up the take for everybody and uh did you so, do that yes well, well I don't know if it screwed up the take but my fork fell off and I got told like um could you please not make your fork fall off and I was like well I didn't mean to make my fork fall off uh but yes uh we were eating a little bit uh I I felt that those scenes were quite tense and I mean that they were quite tense and and so I think in, the, in in my personal experience in a very tense scene at a table I'm less likely to just like tuck in and be munching away so it was all a little bit you know reserved right 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 yeah but there was always in all the other scenes there's always like a glass of champagne everyone's always just got the glass of champagne yeah I, it was a. Uh... It was funny just how it's it's all organized around food. And when I saw, it's like, I know with my family, no one would walk away from, you have to be really angry to walk away from a meal or not, you know, or let it ruin your, your appetite type of thing. Um, yeah, it's, I, I want to, did you, did you, so all your scenes were there. Um, did you go to any of the um, rehabs or how has it affected your, everybody knows someone who is struggling with addiction, is in rehab, has been in rehab. How has it affected your? Well, um, my mother was an alcoholic and uh, she went to rehab and we all, as a family went to a family program at Hazelden. She didn't go to, she oh. went to a place called Crossroads, but we went to a family training session at Hazelden and, and which was very valuable um, because it, it put family members together with patients, not with your own family member, but you could hear both sides. And one of the lessons that I took away from that that was, was very beautiful was we were in a room and there was a moderator and, and everybody was asked to call out a word that described the feeling at the height of the problem, the height of the addiction. And people would say, or a, a word or a feeling, you know, what it felt like. And people would say, I felt angry. I felt alone. I felt judged. I felt spied on. I felt powerless. I felt, uh, you know, like dying. And, and there was eventually a whole list was compiled on the blackboard and the moderator 
turned to us all and said, so does everyone agree with this list? And we all kind of looked it over and said, yes, um, yeah, that about describes it. And she said, I'd just like you to know that everybody has contributed to this list, both the patients and the family members. And so what it feels like when you're the addict is not dissimilar from what it feels like when you're the person helping or watching your beloved person suffer. And, and that idea that we all are going through the same dark and painful emotions um, in addiction was an incredible takeaway and something that uh, has helped me in life actually, not just with issues of addiction, but whenever I'm, there's a conflict between somebody who's dear to me and myself, I realize what I'm feeling is very possibly what that person is also feeling. Mm. If they feel that I'm not listening to them, or if I feel that they're not listening to me rather, they might also feel that I'm not listening to them. That, and that, that's that's a powerful, powerful, that's a really powerful takeaway. Yes, so anyway, uh, I mean, my brother, I mean, my, not my brother, my cousin, um, didn't die from OxyContin, but he died by suicide uh, post drugs um, and at our house. So oh my yes. God. Oh yeah, I, I, I remember hearing about uh, So I, I for sure um, are, um, like everybody, we're all touched by it. And, and what is important is, is what we take away from it and how we, how we, how we move forward and harm reduction, decriminalizing um, addiction and supporting it medically is, is essential. And for, for communities to get together and raise their voices about how the money should be spent to help people who are perhaps underinsured or uninsured um, who have addictions to, to cope with their addiction uh, because, because it's a medical problem. And, um, and in the case of OxyContin, and as dope sick shows, it's a medical problem that was given to people. Yeah. You know, it was forced on people. When you yeah. see a character like Betsy in Dope Sick, played by Caitlin Deaver, yeah. who just wants to work. She just wants to work. And, and the doctor, Michael Keaton, who's both of whose performances are so incredibly moving, but he prescribes OxyContin kind of as a last resort. Yeah. He doesn't have anything else to give her. She's she's desperate. And so he prescribes it and begins, obviously, the very tragic story uh, that, that we see unfold. She's and, a fantastic uh, actress. And you've, and you've interviewed her. Yeah, she's wonderful. Yeah, she's, she's just amazing. And her, her performance in this is, is heartbreaking and moving and funny and, you know, super alive. But I, I remember hearing a radio program some time ago about why painkillers like OxyContin uh, were prescribed in rural areas. And obviously the sales force is a big part of it and produce incredible efforts to, to get those sales up, but also because of the lack of other kinds of medical options. You know, if, if one has a body injury, you need rehab, you need physical rehabilitation. Right, right. And, and you need rehab centers, you need people who are physiotherapists. Right. And, those services are less available in rural places. And so doctors are sometimes faced with not enough options. So somebody's in terrible pain, what would be the best is for them to have some moderate degree of painkillers, perhaps with, you know, non NSAIDs like ibuprofen or Tylenol or whatever, um, and rehab. Right. Um, but that's not an option. And so they go for the painkillers. And then obviously doctors have been corrupted by the whole process, some doctors as well. And so it's, it's, well, it's well, a, you have a the problem It's systemic, is deeply systemic. You know, there's this movie, the documentary, uh, The Painter and the Thief. The thief. Mm. Have you seen it? You've told me about it, but I haven't seen it yet. Well, it takes place in Norway <clears throat> and the thief goes to jail and when you're seeing the services available he's in the hospital and just what he's in just how he's treated in jail the rehab he gets when he's in prison the care 
there are people who would love to be in that jail. I, I mean, I've known that before about um, Norwegian uh, jails, uh, Scandinavian jails, um, where we look at them and it's like, that's prison, but it should be. It, it gets people the services they need. It gives them the skills. So instead of making it so they are completely not able to join back into our into their community, it actually allows them. It gives them the possibility, um, and that's that's another huge problem with our culture. Or, or there's it's the idea of oh, you're taking advantage if you're um, you're being coddled, that kind of thing. Well, and, and this plays into um, classist and racist stereotypes. Yeah. And, and that's a big, a big part of the war on drugs. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, that goes back to, uh, you know, the existential threat of the midterms and uh, the Voting Rights Act, which, you know, why, why that has to be passed and um, why most people are having a hard time sleeping at night. Uh, but uh, let, let's move for a minute uh, to talk about what you're working on now. You're writing a book for young adults. Yes, I am. I'm, uh, this, this started during COVID. I'm in a writer's group and uh, started writing. I'd always wanted to write a, a book that deals with magic and, and is for young people. Because as a, I, I think I'm, I'm still a, a passionate reader, but I think the time, I, I think of myself as a reader and I think that that became true when I was a young person, a young reader. And it's still those books that have shaped who I am, what I think about, how, how morality uh, became interesting to me as a, as a young person. Um, so I love, I love the form. I love books for young people. Uh, I mean, I guess before we would have called them children's books and, and now we would say young adults. And because I have teenagers and it's just come naturally to write something that is much more in the young adult vein. Mm -hmm. Like it's sex positive, it's queer positive. It's, it's about the issues of today. And, um, and I've, I've really been loving writing it. It's, um, it's something I've made of, Oh, I'll say it here. Uh, I promised to finish a draft by my birthday, which is December 4th. I look forward so, to I'm really so, excited. Uh, that's I, I hope by that time I'll have I'll have a draft that I can send to you. Well, well, when Paula Malcolmson introduced me or or was preparing me to meet you, she described you in every capacity: writer, performer, director. I mean, playwright, just everything, you know. And, and it's like, and she's really down to earth, you know, which is like, <laughs> so I've got my finger in a lot of pots, um, just because it's all so exciting to me. I mean, and I'm a little bit of a DIY person as a, as a younger person. And when I was like in college and stuff, you sort of, if you wanted to put on a play, I don't know, you built the sets and, and your friend directed it. So it didn't seem like such a distant thing. And I've I've always kept that. So when it came to me to direct a movie, I, I did. And then I was like, well, I better learn how to edit film. And so I did. And um, and it keeps getting, you know, the, the lessons deepen with with time. And I've been really lucky to have some some wonderful mentors like like Andre Gregory, whose work uh, is is so profound, and whose book, by the way, um, this is not my memoir, is so great is like an essential book but um his his work that uh he takes time it, it's done in a non-traditional way and and so the possible the, the fact that things can happen in many ways has been very inspiring to me and and I've you're very out. much a, of that improv you know yes and you know <laughs> you're, you're there are so many people I mean for me very often I say yes but <laughs> yeah, you know the fear is there, and you might have that fear, but but and you you <laughs> find a way to show up and explore. That's what Darnell says, like about in her directing. How do you make room, creating a safe and organic space for people to play within, so we can play, you know. 
And that's really what you do, whether it's in your characters, whatever you come to with people in your life, personal and professional, it just seems you're always creating a space for people to play. Well, thank you. And I love to play myself and I love playing with you. <laughs> I love playing with you too. <laughs> <laughs> Come play in my sandbox. <laughs> well, yeah, there's a lot of like interesting things to find in sandboxes. There are indeed. There are indeed. And let's make it so that those things are not syringes. Um, <laughs> let's, let's end the war it, on drugs and just be, take just a just, harm reduction model. It just should be cat poop. You know, it should be cat. <laughs> cat poo. Well, ew. <laughs> but yes. But but it is funny. I love that. Looking at that video that my phone sent me on that. It was like this time, whatever. Whether it was like two years ago, where I was. It, you guys were. It was you and Paula, and you were walking away, and I was like, "Don't go!" And I, you know, and I started say like doing this kind of abandonment issues things and and you said that like there like you promised there'd be more and it was going to be something wonderful you know something wonderful and it is it, it is it really but it was funny because yeah you predicted the future which i didn't even know what it would be which is you bringing to life uh sarah your right? masterpiece your incredible incredible work of literature but it was definitely like when I was saying that I I felt so much connection and love and light that there was that even though I was being f funny I was really being honest about this feeling of oh this light is leaving me and that little kid feeling like I don't want to let go of this good time you know mm -hmm. and and it's that remember you're very good at because you're so balanced, it's like, and there will be more, you can, you know. Well, we need the pauses between the good times in order for them to reflect on each other, right? We need night between the day and silence between the music. The, yeah, then there are these Beautiful. studies about dopamine and, and that the brain needing that downtime, like we're not made to have that constant uh, ecstasy, that feeling of, um dopamine pump out uh the, and they're looking at how the brain works in terms of addiction and everything ties in but uh i love your is is the word homeostasis yes i think it is i think okay. that is the word homeostasis my friend noga who's a writer on philosophy and science was teaching me about that and interoceptivity what is that word I interoceptivity and interoception, which I believe is the body's work towards homeostasis. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's amazing. And by the way, something that is, uh, uh, is being discovered in science now is, you know, we, we sort of grew up with the idea of the mind and the body being separate things. Um, they are not, <laughs> they are not separate things. The mind is in the body the body and the mind are connected. And, and if there is one that supersedes the other, it's probably the body that supersedes the mind. Yeah, I, and I love the whole mycelium models as well. You know, the brain being shaped like a mushroom stem and how uh, mushrooms kind of fan out and the uh, intersection of, I mean, we can get really like- <laughs> We could totally go wild on this. I mean, what does dark matter look like other than mycelium, I think? The inside of my vagina, <laughs> at night. Uh, at night, at night, gosh, maybe it's bioluminescence. I would be sitting over the toilet with a purple light. <laughs> with, a, with a black light. Mm, 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 mm. Imagine the nightclub inside there. Mm, 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 inside my vagina dancing. Or the fungus, yeah. Uh, there we go. Yes. I, I had to bring it to a, a really classy conclusion. <laughs> we always have to go there. We always have to go deep. Yeah. So classy. My friend and yeah. Melissa and I, we were going to start a magazine years ago called So Classy. <laughs> and we we're going to put things that 
may or may not be classy. Sounds like a sarcasm. <laughs> um, I love you very much and just thank you for your time today. Thank you, Laura. It was so great to talk with you. I hope everyone will look at Dope Sick. I think it brings up some really wonderful issues, um, not wonderful, but important issues that that we as a country should be should be reckoning with and and um, changing, changing how we uh, handle drugs, changing um, our medical system and and well, moving forward with compassion. Not. We, we, that needs to be changed where people and government are allowed to uh, work in government and then uh, join a board or uh, be a regulator and then join a financial institution that they regulated. It's just insane. That yeah. would happen with uh, the head of the FDA who then joined the farm, the Purdue. Purdue. I mean, or became an employee of Purdue. Absolutely. No. Yes. Uh, the sick, the systemic problems are legion, but, um, but so, are we. We <laughs> so are we. So are we. So are we. All right. Well, thank you, Laura, so much. Thank you. It's a joy to be here. With thank you, you, Winsome Brown, for donating your time this um, lovely event no i'm really it, it was very it was very moving i was really riveted and uh it it opened i i really didn't i i didn't really i i i didn't really understand what every all that went down with oxycontin and this i thought how targeted it was it, i mean it was targeted it, it was not an accident it, it unfolded the way it was designed to unfold. Right, right, yeah. It, it's just like systemic racism. You know, the system is created in a certain way and it works It, it works well. It sure does, and it and, keeps, and, it keeps and the, rolling. And the, I think what we learned from this, it has to, it spreads out to all kinds of addiction. There are so many people right now struggling with, um, harmless addictions but everything from weed to you know alcohol i know a lot of moms who are it's like the you know the 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 mommies who drink kind of thing mm -hmm. um and the more we can talk about it and uh we i related to it as someone who's a food addict you know who has struggled with severe food addiction um but what's interesting is how with the Oxycontin, how when how you had people going in for alcohol and other drugs that it was mostly Oxycontin now and how um, many times it took. So there's a hierarchy of addiction. That, that's that's uh, that, I'm sure that's that's true, um, but I think. I mean, all addiction needs to be treated with compassion and and dignity. And uh, but corporations shouldn't be allowed to manufacture addicts as Purdue did. <laughs> so um, for, to suit their own financial gain, yeah. because you know people were sales reps were given commissions based on how many pills were were sold and uh, yeah. And, and doctors as well. So the, the whole system was just designed to give people more drugs. Watch Dope Sick on Hulu and you'll, you'll understand what we're talking about. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you so much. I love you, I miss you. I love you too. Bye. Bye. Mm.